All right, then let's get started here. Um, so, so welcome back to another Yale Appliance webinar. Today we have 12 unique appliances to consider as our topic. Uh, just some housekeeping notes before we get started. We will be recording this session and we'll share it after um, via email. So be on the lookout for that. Um, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send in any questions that come up along the way. Uh, we'll, we'll, take the, um, we'll spend as much time as we can answering uh, your questions today. Um, just a heads up that you can find all of, our, all of our previous webinars on our YouTube channel. They're all listed in a playlist there. Um, other topics uh, like kitchen renovation mistakes to avoid, uh, appliances you should not buy, and many others are, are on there. Um, and with that out of the way, I'd like to turn over the presentation to our CEO, Steve Scheinkoff. And then um, we will have time for Q&A after the presentation. Steve? Thank you, Pat. Um, and thanks everybody for uh, joining us today. I know we've postponed this a couple of times, so we're really gonna make this worth your while. This is 12 unique appliances to consider. This is not refrigerators, stoves, dishwashers. You've already picked those. Nice thing about these, these are all kind of optional that'll make you enjoy your kitchen better, but they're all point of use. So really think about your lifestyle, where this fits in. I think some of these uh, will resonate. We're also gonna talk about green appliances. Uh, we've, been, uh, we've been talking about green since we've been blogging, but you know, our green heritage, if you will, started back, back, back in 1997. And lastly, we're going to talk about a product we don't even sell, uh, lighting design. I, I really think that you should know the basics. So whether you want to do it yourself or whether you want to interact better with the designer, you can do it. And we have some other webinars on this, but uh, we don't sell lighting anymore. But I really think there is a need. So let's get going. As I said in the introduction, for those that watch the video, all these are optional except for one. So rather than making you wait to the end, we're going to get we're going to get over this in the beginning. Water filtration is something you should do because it works on so many levels. Now I have a water filter I paid five hundred dollars for and replacement cartridge one hundred twenty nine dollars. So that's three thousand gallons that I get for basically five hundred dollars. Now I picked up this water bottle. I didn't drink it. Picked up from the show. Cost of dollar. Right? Now there are eight of these, roughly, a little less. But there's eight of these to every gallon. So that's say eight dollars a gallon. Let's just say it's eight dollars. You can get a deal on it, maybe for fifty cents. That's twenty four thousand dollars in bottled water. Now you're gonna say there's no way I'm gonna I'm going to go through three thousand gallons of bottled water. Maybe, but think about your family if everybody else has one. So that's significant expense. Again, we're not even talking about the landfill and the plastic consequences. Um, we're gonna get into green a little bit later, but this is actually really the smartest purchase as it works on, on, on many levels. Now, it's carbon resin ceramic, which mimics natural aquifers. And again, we're not treating, you know, we're in the United States, most of us live in municipal areas, we're not treating uh, malaria, swamps and filtering that, um, we're, we're filtering municipal waters in Boston. We've got very good municipal water because we pay for it with MWRA. But this is something you should really consider doing because it works on many levels. I, I've been doing it for years because I used to live in a fifth floor walk up and I used to carry those huge bottles up and, until I, I thought there must've been a better way than there is. So really, if you get nothing out of it, get a filter. And these are the things we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna talk about Insta Hot Waters, Sinks, I know you're gonna say sink's not an appliance. And my retort is what to use the most in your kitchen, that would be your sink. I'm gonna talk about built-in coffee makers, wine storage, a lot about drawers, refrigerator drawers, microwave drawers, warming drawers, speed ovens, um, air switches for garbage disposal, something everybody should have. Um, burners on the grill. You know, it's not typically what you think of the kitchen, but a lot of people are going with outside spaces, so we're gonna go a little bit over that. Compact laundry, I want you to think about laundry in a different way. And you can do that because a lot of laundry you can buy is now ventless. So any space can be a laundry room. Then we're gonna go a little bit into green appliances, the three that, um, the three that you should consider. And then we're gonna get in, really the most of what I'm gonna be talking about is basic lighting design. So this will be interesting. 
Um, I think you'll enjoy it. Let's get to the first one. Uh, but before we do, as Pat mentioned, these are past webinars. This is going to be a good one. You know, uh, the guy that used to plan the webinar said my content was interesting but depressing with a lot of what not to do in a kitchen renovation, 11 kitchen renovations to avoid. I think you need a framework of what not to do to get it right. So, uh, but this one's not like that. This is really interesting stuff that you could put into your kitchen. Uh, as again, construction is divided in equal parts. Designing, which we're not really going to get into. Scheduling, this is more about selection. Last one's closer, which probably is the toughest to do in construction nowadays. So let's get to it. Insta hot water. I used to have one of these and I, I had to remove it for a water filter and, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, and I'll get into that when we get into the sinks. Insta hot water, every morning I make turmeric tea, turmeric black pepper, cinnamon, uh, lemon juice, and I boil in a kettle. It takes three to five minutes if I get it right. By hitting that lever on the left, you get an instant hot water, which is nice if you have a larger family and you make a lot of coffee, tea. It's great for um, sanitizing um, baby bottles quickly and, and, and pacifiers as well. So it's a, it's a really nice kind of luxury item to have. It makes about 40 to 60 cups of, uh, of water. Now, sinks, I, I realized as I said before, sinks are not in the clients. However, most people get a, a smaller sink, including myself. Now, if you cook a lot, uh, what happens is you, know, you need pots and pans in your sink. You want your sink big enough to handle uh, if you cook all those pots and pans. It, and um, typically, the, the, what people plan for is a 25-inch uh, kitchen sink because that fits the 25-inch base cabinet. We should start thinking about 30 because you can add more like if I had a 30 inch sink, I would have been able to add the Instahot and the water filter and the um, air switch and the faucet. Again, with sinks, and we cover this more in our design videos, sinks are a great place to start because it's, uh, it's really where you are most in your, in your kitchen. When you think of the kitchen triangle, uh, it's sinks, dishwashers, and stovetops as the things you really need to centralize. And they fit well on kitchen islands, unlike cooking. So if you, if you have the room, Think of a kitchen, that, think of a sink that's a little bit more than 25 inches. Coffee makers, sister swears by her meal. You can make gourmet coffee. And what I like about meal of coffee systems, and you can buy a bunch of them um, that do ground coffee. Meal is easy. It gives you a interface, their MasterChef interface, where you just touch a button to make espresso. It foams the milk. Um, you can make cappuccino. She makes a blueberry latte with special syrup that comes out great. Now, one of the things that people don't tell you is many of the luxury appliances, I'd include ice makers, or coffee systems, they need to be clean regularly um, or they won't work. The good thing about meal is it'll tell you when to clean it and you hit a button to clean it. So coffee systems are nice at it. Wine storage is something you can put in, um, you can put in your kitchen as well, uh, under counter or column style. Wine is, is, is a little bit difficult. When you see wine stored in vineyards, usually if they have a cave, they'll put it there because uh, wine is a living grape. Any kind of light, humidity change, vibration, or change in temperature will alter the taste of that living grape. Best one is Sub-Zero. True makes a good one as well. A lot of the other ones are really uh, refrigerators with racks in them. So if you're really storing wine, you want something a little bit better than that. You know, uh, I've seen uh, climate-controlled rooms, which are good. Uh, basements, as long as you know it meets the humidity standards and um, the temperature temperature standards, are a good place to put them. But you can do it in your kitchen with really a good one as well. And there's really good applications to it. Like you could put it in, implemented in your refrigerator. That's Sub Zero refrigerator with a refrigerator. Um, that's the the wine system with the uh, refrigerator drawers underneath it. Now, a lot of people. Um, we talk about beverage centers being the most popular. And again, when you're talking about putting point of use refrigeration, and they have that here on the right-hand side, beverage centers, um, wine centers, is what do you store? Um, wine centers are specific to wine. You know, they have the racks, it's what they can do. Beverage center can, can store all kinds of beverage, but not wine long-term. We look at this true, you know, they have the wine standing up and you don't, you see it, you want it lying flat because it dries the cork, cork opens up, lets uh, air into the wine and ruins the taste of the wine. 
So this isn't something you store long term. You do have undercounters that will that will store the wine vertically, which is what you should, be, or horizontally, which is what you should be doing. Um, but again, figure out what you want to store and then buy. If it's refrigerators, if it's if it's beverage, if it's wine, you could buy the point of use product for that or put it in a column like it's shown here. Refrigerator drawers I love. I have one in my house. This is great, especially for kids. You keep them out of the main, keep them out of the main refrigerator. Again, refrigeration, you can put anywhere in your kitchen because you don't need to immediately go there because nothing will spoil, will burn. Um, but refrigerator drawers are, are excellent. You can put their yogurts in it. Or you can put, we put uh, fruits because we chop the fruits right there. Great point of use items for refrigerator drawers. Microwave drawers have become popular as well. Um, they're more attractive than say a microwave with that stainless steel trim that a lot of us saw like 20 years ago. And a lot of people going away from the over the range microwave because over the range microwave is only 310 CFM with very shallow capture area. So if you cook, an over the range microwave can't handle it. So people going with drawers, you can put those anywhere again, you hit a button, the draw shoots out at you, okay? Uh, you hit another button, it closes. All of them actually made by shock. Every brand has it. It can be placed anywhere. You want one, and most can be done this way. Flush mounting just looks a little bit nicer. Here's a little trick. A lot of people that are buying Thermador Gen Air, Sub-Zero, they get rebates. You can apply $13.99 or rebate and buy this for three to $500 with the, um, with the one, two, free or the Gen Air, um, the Gen Air uh, rebates. Warming drawers. I used to be a, I used to be against warming drawers because in my mind, why does this cost a thousand fifteen hundred when you get a whole stove uh, by LG, G, or Samsung that have a warming drawer in it? But I'm beginning to warm. I was gonna say warm up to a warming drawer. Uh, I'm beginning to like warming drawers only because you know when I go home, sometimes my sometimes my daughter likes to eat before me, so I get all the food that's on the burner and the texture, consistency of temperature isn't what it could be. And I think a warming drawer will solve a lot of those problems. And it's good, like if you're cooking and eating at different times, just consider a warming drawer. And you could put these, once again, anywhere, right? Under wall ovens, you know, in, in base cabinets anyway. They typically are, they fit 24, 30 inch, which is typically the most common base cabinets. Speed ovens, well, we have uh, Saab on, who's a master, to answer your questions and speed them, you may like this appliance the best uh, because this is microwave, this is convection, but the beauty behind it is a combination. And what that does is when you put a combination bake setting or combination boil setting, a combination bake is 90% convection, 10% full microwave power. So you get that speed without getting that rubbery microwave texture. Uh, boiling, it's 70, 30 for more dense items. So you can really bake and boil in this um, with less time in a speed oven, and you get less preheat time as well. Once again, these can go anywhere in the kitchen. I love this. This is simple and easy to do. When I was a kid, we had a disposer. My mom used to go like to the other side of the kitchen, flip the switch, disposer comes on, she has to come back, use a disposer, go back. And a lot of people put switches on uh, next to sinks. You can put it right on. The, you can... You can buy these like um, from the faucet company to match exactly the faucet you have. Just hit a button. It's electronically feeds the same way a switch does. Uh, this is a really good idea, um, especially even if you get a larger sink, you can put this with pretty much anything. Burgers of the Grill, this is just another mistake I made. You don't have to do this uh, of buying, say, a Lynx or a Heston and buy a separate set that's kind of expensive. Weber has it's only $100 more to buy a uh, grill with burners. So that way you can boil your lobsters and grill the tails right on the grill without having to go back and forth. Now the rule of thumb, and we, we did our first webinar on outside kitchens is the further you are from your kitchen, the more you need outside refrigeration, burners. But burners is something I wish I had, even though the grill is semi-close to the, the kitchen, you have to keep going back and forth. So it's something you, you may wanna consider in a renovation. I want you to think about laundry a different way. Now, European laundry is designed for Europeans. It's all 24 inches. Now, the standard 
cabinet in your kitchen is also 24 inches. So you can put these anywhere. A lot of these are ventless. There's heat pump uh, that use compressors to dry and then there's uh, condensers that project the heat out, but you don't need to run venting. So really any, you know, you know, a lot of my friends, kids went to college or they left the house. You can turn their closets into laundry rooms. You could put kitchen into laundry rooms. You don't have to trudge down to your basement to do your laundry. You can put these really anywhere that's 20, any closets, you know, roughly a little more than 24 inches wide and a little more than 24 inches deep. Um, you could put them in kitchens uh, like so. Very easy to put in closets as well. Again, you don't have to run them. So you put it anywhere. All right, let's talk about green. You may not know this, the person who did this PowerPoint didn't know this, we actually won the first Boston Green Award. Because back then, you know, we wanted to make green a priority for our customers, but we don't want to say, hey, you know, buy this green appliance and over 20 years, you're going to save 3%, 4%. What we want to show is people that have quick wins. Now, you fast forward 17 years, refrigerators are basically all, even if they're not energy star, the difference between an energy star and a non-energy star is roughly 9%. And refrigerators now, like a 22 cubic foot, runs about $77 a year to run, so it's about $70. One thing I will say about refrigerators, uh, before the standards kicked in, you were spending a lot of money. You'd spend three, $400 plugging in that old refrigerator in the basement thinking you needed added storage, where you could buy probably an 18 cubic foot and get a return on your investment within the first couple of years, right? Uh, that's Tom Nino on the right was, we, we designed this whole green project logo. And one of the leaves just right, I drove, I drove that person, you know, Karen was her name, I, I drove her so crazy that I figured I'd invite her to the, uh, to the awards and, uh, ceremony. It's kind of cool. But anyway, the best green products that you can buy that you need immediate investment, uh, uh, return on investment. There's water filters we, are, we, we already talked about. Nowadays, LED bulbs, it's interesting because we've been blogging about LED since 2007, and it's really interesting the evolution. And front load washers, because it's really interesting to see the de-evolution of what people are buying now, whereas what I thought they would be buying. So what I think you should be buying. And LED is just blown up. And even if you're just planning a renovation and you've got existing bulbs, it would you get an immediate impact by just changing your incandescent or even fluorescent to LED. Because now one, when I started, it was one to four. We actually imported some of the first LED bulbs into the, uh, into the country. And um, it's now one watt, is now nine watts of incandescent. So a hundred watt bulb is essentially 10, 10 LED watts. You know, the hours are 40 to 50,000 hours versus 750 to 2000. But really the other part that, Nobody thought of it. And we only did because our showroom used to be incandescent bulbs and we could never air condition it well enough because most of the incandescent energy goes to heat. So the outer rim is like the outer edge of the bulb, which is why I could never change it while it was on 335.4 degrees versus 82.7. So you're going to realize, you know, much less load in your AVAC, especially if, you're, if you own a store. And I imagine everybody's converted to LED by now, but if you haven't, get an immediate return on your investment just from an HVAC standpoint. So, and I'm gonna tell you very shortly in the next section, what type of LED bulbs to buy. Um, but LED is huge and it, it's good that everybody's kind of replaced it now. The other thing is from the washers have evolved now, a, you know, your basic GE or, or your better GE is now five cubic feet. Um, our parents were washing with 2.5, and we still sell you a lot of Speed Queen. Speed Queen's 50 gallons. It's like a lot like my mom used to, used to have. It's 3.2 capacity. But really, when you take the volume of the agitator, it's 2.5. So we're talking about double the capacity, right? We look at the RPM spin. I mean, if we look at just the, the gallons, we multiply the gallons times two, right? Because the capacity is twice. You're looking at 100 gallons versus 15 gallons. RPM spin speed, one is 1,300 on the G. And a lot of the... A lot of the better front loads are between 1,000 and 1,300. You can get a meal at 1,600 RPM spin. What, I, what an RPM spin does, it, it really almost dries the fabric. So you get less drying time. In electricity, when you're given, you're still spending overall less per load on a front load than you would on a top load. Now, I'm not saying you know, we can solve the whatever crisis, but we all had water filters, LED bulbs, 
from the washers, a lot of the other issues may disappear countrywide, but certainly you're going to uh, realize an immediate return on investment just incorporating those three things. We go from green appliances to green lighting. And you know, it's funny when I thought of this, you're gonna say, oh, green, very, very uh, insightful. I, I didn't, never really thought of it that way. I just picked this up. This is a kitchen um, that we're gonna redesign later because it's flawed. But it, the reason why I picked this is because when we're in lighting, this is the question that everyone asks. How many pens do I fit over my eye? And the answer is like, everyone says, do I do two? Do I do three? Do I do four? Does it matter? And the answer to that is yes, uh, all those are correct. If we go back here, this is what happens. You're planning, you're planning your, your, decorative, your decorative light to light really the kitchen. Unfortunately, you're chopping your vegetables or you're spending most of your time in your sink. Where's the light in the sink? Kitchens and to a lesser degree baths are the only rooms we need task lighting. You get it wrong in your living room, you can add a lamp. In fact, nowadays you get it wrong, in your living room. what do you do when you, when you go watch TV? The first thing you do is you turn down your light. So lighting is really essential in two places, kitchen and in the mirror of your bathroom. And we'll get to that in a second. So let's look at really good lighting. And let me tell you something, I had to go through a house and go scan through literally 50, 60 pages to get this one. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't see decorative lighting in a lot of, in a lot of house stuff, you know, in these, you know, professional uh, photographs. And I'm like, I'd be like, when you get your house professionally photographed, what do they add? Light it. So really that's not a good indication of what you should be doing. So let's talk about what you should be doing now. The, the skeleton of your, of your lighting is not decorative, it's task lighting. And that's recessed or track. You could do it in a modern home, post and, wheels, post and beam ceilings, do a lot of track lighting. And under counter, I'm a big under counter guy. And I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures of where to put that. Okay? Ambient is, is probably the hardest. When a lot of people think about lighting down, they don't think about lighting the ceiling up. Okay? And then there's accent lighting, which is highlighting objects on the counter. Under, under cabinet does that. And then we talk about decorative, which is really, decorative does add lighting, but it personalizes the space, right? The fixtures that you put in make the, make the kitchen uniquely you. When you think about it, a lot of you are doing white kitchens, white tile. Really the way to distinguish it is with lighting that we no longer sell, ideally. So when you see a photo like this, what I want you to see is this, okay? What makes this so good is they've got the proper accent lighting. Um, and they could, they've added it in both places there. They've got under cabinet lighting all through their kitchen. And they could have added it in the soffit, but they, they added ambient in the soffit here, but they could have done it under the cabin as well. And they've got the right amount of, of recessed. If you're looking for recess, recess is because um, LED is so, yeah, you've got such high output. I usually start at the sink and do one every three to four foot, but you want to put lighting you know, in the main areas where you're gonna be, which is really refrigerator, uh, stove, sink, uh, those type of areas. So that's how I want you to look at lighting. Those four areas, task first, ambient if you can, accent lighting, which is easy to do with under cabinet, and then decorative, which is really adds your personal in this space. This is actually, this is a, this is a picture I really like. This is a, uh, a kitchen that we have in, in Hanover. And if you look at it, Look at underneath the cabinet there. They put it in the toe kicks. What I like about this, and you can put it on a separate switch if you don't want to do it, but think about like, if you want to get a drink of water at night, you can leave that on rather than fumbling for a switch if you want to get a drink of water in the kitchen. I, I really like that effect of doing it, um, of under cabinet that way. Um, the the uh, decorative can be ambient as well. That, that uh, chandelier shoots up as well as down. We have the right amount of task lighting in there. We have more in the uh, commercial ceiling. As we have actually, in Hanover, we have track lighting um, on our commercial ceiling. So this is really well lit. Again, this is accent lighting. Now, you take a look at the, at the cabinet on the left, right? This is a, a really well done um, picture. We look at it, you got under cabinet lighting underneath it. But the moment you add silverware and you have the, um, and you have the light go from up down. You see how it, you know, you have that opaque, you have the dark spot there. The better way of doing it is just adding just like 
You could do uh, little diodes, um, but just add just regular uh, strip under counter winding and just cover the whole cabinet rather than just going top down, especially if, got, if you want to highlight your silver. So you get a much more even, consistent one. Once again, here's another pretty good picture um, of accent decorative and ambient. Right? Another pretty good picture. So let's go back to our green kitchen. Here's what I would do. Right? I'd add ambient um, over that island there to add light to the ceiling. You're definitely going to add some recents and, and, and start at the sink and move your way out. At the, at the bottom, I put some under uh, cabinet lighting, and that's how to make the that's how to make the kitchen better. Adding all those elements to make it a more well lit functional space. Right. So we'll take this picture of someone that could have put ambient light better. We're going to start with task. Don't forget under cabinet, decorative lighting is last. And the other one last tip that a lot of people do inadvertently is don't place lights behind you. You create shadows. So think about chopping vegetables with the light behind you. Your head's gonna be in the way in the shadow, okay? Those are some just basic rules. And now let's just talk about um, bath lighting. Now, a lot of design, a lot of people say, well, you gotta, you know, bath is a task application, but I'm pretty sure that if I don't light our bathtub well, my daughter will be able to find a rubber ducky just fine, right? Um, if, you're in, if you're in the shower and you put one recess instead of two, guess what? You're gonna be able to find the shampoo, and shampoo yourself up, soap yourself up just fine. What you're not gonna be able to do, what you need to do is for shaving and for placing makeup, right? Is you wanna cross illuminate your face. And the way to do that is by doing, you could do it with, um, I've done it with recessed on either side of the mirror. But most commonly, it's, it's wall sconces. Now, a lot of people put fancy wall sconces in. The height depends on your height because you don't want to look in the bulb. So you want 64 to 68 inches off the floor, roughly. The other thing to do is just put a, you know, a, a, a larger sconce in, like here, and, and not worry about it. You're going to cross eliminate the person shaving there is going to see both sides of the face. On the other hand, on the other side, the makeup mirror, you only have one light. So you're gonna be able to, you're gonna to have to move your face towards the light. So your right side's gonna be good, your left side you have to move it out. What I would do if you wanna put pendants in is put a pendant on the left-hand side as well, or just illuminate it with a recess from the top down. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about quality of light. Because this is what a lot of people get wrong. And unfortunately it's hard to get right because I think a lot of manufacturers put Kelvin temperatures um, on their light that they really aren't. So you almost have to do trial by error and buy a nice, buy a little bit nicer bulb. You know, the 10 for $2 they get on Amazon, I can tell you because I bought them, they blink. So you want to buy a nicer, uh, you want to buy a better LED bulb. And really what people, when, when, when people buy bulbs, you should change them by, you should, you should differ by location. So in kitchen, you want, 2,500 to 3,000 to capture the natural tones of the kitchen, right? That's very flattering light. When you think about, you know, candlelight's very flattering. What's unflattering is sunlight. You know, a lot of people put skylights in, which is a good idea, but it's not the best light to look good by, right? But what a 5,000 degree Kelvin bulb will do for you is it's great in closets, right? For someone that's got a lot of navy and black first thing in the morning, you can't distinguish it. A 5,000 degree Kelvin, uh, a, a higher Kelvin temperature bulb will be able to better distinguish those darker, you know, blacks and blues. So really 25 to 3,000 in your kitchen and uh, 5,000 in the closets, four to 5,000 in the closets. And unfortunately, um, you have to find the better bulbs. I love this, right? What they did, although they don't show any, they don't show any earth tone, they don't, they do mostly earth tones and whites here. Um, I imagine that someone here will have a, a black or blue pair of pants eventually. What they did is they put a skylight in there. So they just got, they just put the natural lighting in, but just putting skylight, it's a good idea. Again, for, for those of you that can't put a, 
that don't want to or can't put a skylight, just a 5,000 degree Kelvin bulb will do the same. So here are your key takeaways before the questions. Is buy a water filter and LED bulbs and maybe the air switch, because those are the ones that make the sense, the most sense. But pick out the unique appliances that work for your lifestyle. A lot of these, you don't need to be in your refrigerator. You don't need to be in your microwave. You don't need to be in um, your speed oven like you do stirring a pot or being at your sink. Those should be central. A lot of these can be decentralized um, without any problem. So pick the ones that, that work for you, whether it's wine, beverage, or refrigeration, and uh, pick them up for your lifestyle. Don't put the lighting, don't put lighting behind you in recessed. Remember, it's 2,500 um, to 3,000 Kelvin in your kitchen, four to 5,000 in your closet. With that, I'll, I'll bring it over to Pat. We have on our call Pat, who's really the brains behind the operation. He's the CMO of the company in charge of uh, sending all the content. Shan Stoner did this. She's been here one year and already created 150 videos with 3 million views. And your cooking questions, there's one thing that you ought to do too. Um, beside the ear switch, the LED bulbs, uh, is get on um, Saba's uh, Instagram feed. Instagram feed got her into Chopped, where she won the Chopped Grand Champion, or Moth or Stewart, no less. Uh, but um, her job is to use all the stuff to better uh, tell you how to use it, uh, and, and better yet, um, what recipes will work for you, so you can really enjoy it. It's one thing to the bias be on it's another one to use it for sure. So next webinar, we go back to the dark side, how to buy uh, appliances during a supply crisis, which has dramatically gotten worse over the last uh, you know, 30, 60 days. So we'll cover that. I'm gonna have a blog post about it to get you ready probably in the next two weeks. And that will be Thursday, October 28th, right before Halloween, same time, 11 a.m. With that, uh, we'll leave it to Pat and answer any questions that we Awesome, thank you, Steve. Um, before we dip into the Q and A here, you'll be able to sign up for that webinar in the email in the email when we share this presentation recording. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, so do, do use continue to use the Q and A feature in the Zoom um, to send us questions. Start by diving into some of the questions to, um, sent in during the registration. Um, maybe Steve, right off the top. Um, What's the most underutilized kitchen appliance? The one you don't use. Like I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. Like I want people to start thinking of the sinks because you know we're going to islands, putting high BTU um, burners in our islands, and we don't want to do overhead hoods. So start with the sink. But the most underutilized appliances are any of the things I just mentioned. Like I'll give you a perfect example. Um, we have a steam oven. I love steam ovens. Saba can talk about steam. She is amazing with steam. And I probably should include it in the, in, the, in the video. But my girlfriend doesn't like using it, doesn't want to learn how to use it. So it sits idle in my kitchen. That would be underused. Really, is my goal here is not to go out and say, hey, buy these 12 items because of work in the kitchen. That's not the point. If you buy all this stuff and don't use it, they're all underutilized. So really go in there. And I always tell people when I was selling is, buy what you use or buy what you know you will use. You know, for my sister, that meal of coffee system is on every day, twice a day. Um, that's a good purchase for her. For someone that doesn't want to clean it and it doesn't, and it doesn't work, that's underutilized. So it really, the, the answer really depends on what it is you will use and how much you use. We do say that often. It's, it is important to evaluate how you, how you and your family are living and how the appliances uh, can contribute to that. Um, that's the, that was a good segue, Steve, to this next question. Uh, a steam oven and a microwave versus a speed oven, and maybe Saba can jump in here as well. Uh, what are the maybe the pros and cons in that comparison? Um, steam versus, uh, I'm sorry, steam versus? I think it's a steam oven and a microwave versus a speed oven. Oh, I think now I'll answer this like basically, and then we'll give it to someone who, who uses it all the time. When you're talking about steam, you're talking about a different way of cooking. Steam is more healthy. When you talk about steam adding, adding moisture, not baking out nutrients. 
If you use a steam, like if we used a steam oven, our food would taste better, no question about it. Whereas, you know, you look at the other things like a speed oven, speed oven will cook quicker um, without the preheat times. But if you really want to uh, talk to someone who is an expert at this, I, I think, you know, Saba should take over from here. Absolutely. I think um, it's a great question because we don't often get the combination of speed, uh, sorry, of the steam and the microwave versus speed. And I think if you're thinking about doing a combination of a steam oven and a microwave uh, versus speed, you're definitely going to have more cooking options available um, with that combo because you'll get the um, nutritious, healthy, food and all the versatility of the steam oven. And for those things that you really need to microwave, like your liquids, you're reheating your coffee, popping your popcorn, things like that, you can get a smaller, inexpensive microwave to take care of that. Whereas if you were just to get a speed oven, then you are more limited with the options for cooking and you wouldn't even you know, all you kind of get is convection and speed with that, which does serve a purpose and is, is great for people that live that sort of lifestyle where you need to get food on the table really quick. And, um, you know, you might be reheating things more often than not. So, um, and, you know, as we've mentioned multiple times, it comes down to your lifestyle, what it is that you do in the kitchen, how you utilize your appliances, what kind of food you make. So I think those are the questions to sort of ask yourself to evaluate uh, where the, you know, right investment is. But the combination of steam and microwave, you have a lot of cooking options there. Awesome. Thanks, Saba. Um, Next question is about ventilation. It comes from someone who has read our ventilation buying guide. Um, can we provide some more info on hidden ventilation? Um, can ventilation fit into a soffit above a slide in range? Kind of a specific example, but there is that um, blower type of ventilation. Steve, you want to chime in there? Yeah, I, I'll, I, let me let me give you. Let's 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 uh, turn the. Turn the clock back to 1988. I'm living with my two best friends. They had a Roper range with a new tone, kind of like what we're talking about is Best has that new um, uh, semi new. It's three years old. I forget what they call it. They've got cute names for everything. I keep forgetting. Um, it's that flat stainless. It's in that green kitchen photo, flat stainless piece. Well, we had the new tone, which is certainly not as powerful. I think it was like 400 CFM. And all around it, was grease, right? Because, and, and I haven't tested the best to be honest with you. I, I'm kind of old school in what I really think to vent. If you were to cook and you were to walk, I assume the worst. Cooking is walking, frying, kind of like what we do at home. Um, stir frying, all the rest. You don't want a flat ventilator because what happens is really the good ventilation, like we look at the picture right here, Drake's kitchen. He's got a lock on your vent. It's 27 inches deep because smoke is captured, right? And then it's sucked out. Like you can have a, you can have a perfectly good 1200 CFM hood. It's 21 inches deep. Smoke's going to go billow past. And my fear with those, uh, those flat, when I look at the best and I look at the flat, I see no capture. So I'm, I'm thinking the smoke dissipates and hits the ceiling before it gets captured by the, um, by the, uh, by the, by the vent itself. So it's, it's certainly better than any other. It's, it's a good last resort option if you have to do it. I mean, it's certainly better than a downdraft where you're reversing gravity with an elbow to go down through a long run. But it's not something that I would advise if you were to go, quite honestly. And sticking with ventilation, um, just, a, just another reminder, we use the Q&A uh, feature here to add any questions we can dive into. Um, one more question on ventilation, Steve. Um, the question is phrased as, I've got, a, I've got a 40 year old downdraft cooktop, 36 inches. Modern um, made. Modern made, yep. And given your, our low opinion of downdrafts, someone who's watched a couple of these webinars, sounds like, um, what are some potential options um, looking to replace that? 
You know, it's funny, I even know the model number of that piece. It's gas, it's called KGT693. That'll remember. When I get home tonight, you know, my girlfriend said, well, did you remember that thing that was like on my desk? That I won't remember. Um, look, it really depends on what you do. If we're talking about totally gut remodeling a, a kitchen, then my suggestion would be one of two things, is put it on the wall where, where, where you get more options or put an overhead hood, which is really hard to do if you're in a condo. So I'm sure that your upstairs neighbor wouldn't appreciate the, uh, the, the exhaust. But the other thing you can do is, okay, if this is the last resort option, which is what I'm reading here, is let's pick a cooktop that emits less heat, that, um, that's a little bit more energy efficient. To me, I think induction would be your best option. You gotta, it's got a 30 inch induction and it will do with it, with it backdraft. It's certainly better, it is not ideal, especially the more you cook, the more smoke you create, the worse it is. And you know now they're doing studies and everything. You know, the air in our homes is more polluted than the air outside. You know, they talk about IAP, internal air pollution, IQ, internal air quality. And they say poor ventilation is worse than smoking. You know, we did that ventilation last time. It's surprising. Um, but I, I really think that we ought to take ventilation more seriously. So if you're saying, I got to replace it with something. What do I replace it with? I'd say induction. Um, that's the best I can do for it because I really think it's, it's somewhat of a flaw to me. One more here, um, microwave drawers. Um, question from the presentation. What about the microwave interior height in the drawer? Is that a disadvantage? Um, and mentioning Wolf has a, has a greater height and uh, with a standard door. That's an interesting one. I've never measured Wolf because I, all of these microwave drawers are made by Sharp. Sharp makes all of them. You know, there's no Wolf one, Thermidor one, Bosch one, Viking one, and, and, and I read blog posts, just, and, and everyone's got a flowery description of the eight best microwave drawers. There's no best microwave drawers. Shop's got the microwave convection drawer, and they've got the other one that you can hook up to Alexa and wave at, and it'll open. Those two are the best. Everything else is really the same microwave. I haven't measured the wolf, but I can imagine, if you're looking for a different microwave drawer, I really, there really isn't any other than the company that actually makes it. Um, I have a wolf um, and you know, I put liquids and plates and everything else in it, but you know, I'm not putting anything tall in this to be honest. And I've never really measured. We did just, um, we did just update our article and video about microwave drawers. Um, just very recently, if anyone wants to find that on YouTube or on our blog. Um, a follow-up there, Steve, about this. Um, I think it's comparing the microwave drawer to the Wolf microwave um, with the pull-down door. Any pros and cons there, Saba? Do you have any insight into you know day-to-day -day use of those types? Um, I would say that if uh, the height uh, issue is something in, that is important to you, um, then I would go with, yeah, like something like the wolf with the pull down door. That's going to be a better option. Um, there is definitely a slight disadvantage having um, lesser height in a drawer type setup. Uh, so, you know, again, it depends on what it is you're using that microwave for, but you get more height in a um, in that wolf that you're talking about. Saben, yeah. um, oh, go ahead, Steve. No good, no good. I was gonna say, Saben, you know, are there any um, any types of cooking that you've, that common cooking you haven't been able to use in a standard microwave drawer? Anything that doesn't fit typically? I would say if you're like trying to maybe defrost a large item, sometimes that could be a challenge in, um, you know, something tall, maybe, uh, you know, so you froze something in a large container that might not fit into 
um, a regular microwave drawer. Uh, but that's typically what people use microwaves for, right? To reheat, to defrost, and to uh, and for liquids. So you know, it really depends on the container that you're using um, in that space. For the microwave drawer, I've used. Um, 16 ounce containers, which fit fine, but if it's a larger um, container that you used um, to freeze something or store something, uh, then it's obviously, it's gonna be a height issue. So other than that, I haven't come across any other real drawbacks because I do use um, sometimes uh, 16 ounce containers, um, oh, actually 24 ounce containers, sorry, in there, and they work just fine. They, I've used those to reheat things. I, I always I always tell people you know there's a couple couple things is like um, is to bring in you know there's um, is to bring in the the the, uh, the plates the containers that you use and and try it out in the store yourself rather than 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 finding out everybody's different the the way this really is supposed to work and one of the reasons why we do webinars and clients one hundred ones and sub is like people should be asking you questions of what's important to you. It shouldn't be like, and I, I think a lot of people in our industry kind of get it wrong in terms of companies is like, you say, well, I want a stove and they bring you to a stove without asking you what you want in that stove, whether you want a steam or speed. And a lot of this, that's what really should drive the purchase is like, like I don't have a steam oven and my sister has a coffee maker because we're buying for ourselves. Um, and that's really the way you got to do it is, is, is really, it's it, unfortunately in a lot of places when you're, when you're talking about appliances is, is really you have to you have to be your be best advocate how are you going to use this stuff let's bring in the containers and see if it'll fit and ask yourself these lifestyle questions because you know you're unique to you and and, and you should buy accordingly um, and, and unfortunately when you see a lot of information on the website that's giving you the best stuff that that best stuff may not be right for you we mentioned about you know if you like to broil you, you shouldn't be buying a dual fuel range because Electric broilers just don't work that well. And, and there's all sorts of little hidden landmines that you don't want to find out after it's, after it's in your uh, kitchen, right? So that, that's kind of the way. So, it, it, you know, to the person asking the question is, you know, feel free uh, to bring your containers to an appliance store and, and, and let's figure out definitively if it'll work before you get it and find out it doesn't. Mm -hmm. so. One more just came in here is, um... Is there a steam microwave drawer combination available? Who wants to take that one? I don't think it's steam. I know there's a microwave convection combination with Sharp. I don't know. I don't think they have a steam drawer. I mean, Mila's got those uh, vacuum drawers, but those aren't steam drawers. Um, you know, you, 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 better question for you. Yeah, I have not uh, come across any other appliances, uh, you know, specialty appliances that have steam, it would typically be just a steam oven, or a wall oven with a add added steam option. So um, yeah, but no drawer style that I can think of. I know there's some countertop, um, uh, you know, uh, appliances that ha offer steam, but I don't know that much about them. Okay, that's all our questions so far. Um, that's all of our questions. Um, so I think that's a good stopping point there. Steve, I think that's a really great um, thought that you were wrapping up a key takeaway there is really it's about finding what works for you. Um, so it's, you know, take that extra step of bringing in the pans. It may sound silly, but bringing in the pans to the store, make sure everything fits. Uh, you're gonna use these products for a number of years. Hopefully it's, it's really important to get it right. Um, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up here. Like I, I mentioned at the beginning, we will be sharing this via email um, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, shortly. Be on the lookout for that email with, um, with, that, with that recording and with this invite to our next topic. And with that, thanks for joining and have a great day.